during which the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General David H. Berger, will relinquish command of the United States Marine Corps. Please rise for the arrival of the official party. Please remain standing for the invocation, which will be delivered by the Chaplain of the Marine Corps, Rear Admiral Kerry H. Cash, Chaplain Corps, United States Navy. I invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, by whose love humanity is redeemed, in whose strength the warrior is made ready for the day of battle, and to whom nations must one day answer, into your hands we commend this ceremony, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. For General David Berger, who relinquishes his duties as our 38th Commandant, we give you thanks. Standing amidst the current of a world moving at alarming speed, General Berger has led Marines and the Marine Corps to discern, innovate, change, and overcome. Immovable in what matters the most, the Marine and his rifle. General Berger has been a change agent for our national defense. Bless his efforts, O Lord, where those efforts have made our Marine Corps more effective, Marines more faithful, and this nation more secure. Help he and Donna see that you are the one who has sustained them these many years, for you are always faithful, and you will remain always faithful for the future they cannot fully see. At peace are they whose minds are stayed on you, O God. May the burghers look unto you this day as they call to mind the past and welcome the future. For that leader who will take up the mantle that General Berger relinquishes, we ask your abundant provision, O God. In the midst of this sea change, grant unto our acting commandant, General Smith, your grace. And on that day when a new commandant is named, we ask that you imbue that leader with moral rigor, a heart singular in purpose, wisdom and courage, humility and the fear of God. As the psalmist declares, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Be our shield, O God, now and forevermore, from every peril to the core. Amen. Please be seated. by the United States Marine Drum and Bugle Corps. Formed in 1934, known as the Commandant Zone, the unit celebrates over 88 years of marching and musical excellence while carrying the distinction of being the only Drum and Bugle Corps currently serving in the United States Armed Forces. The unit will open today's conference with the march. 
by Robert Jaeger, written as a tribute to the men and women of the United States Marine Corps, appropriately entitled Esprit de Corps. Marine Barracks, Washington, D.C. proudly presents the Commandant's Own United States Marine Drum and Bugle Corps. The concert continues with a unique blend of Latin jazz standards made famous by artists Johnny Richards and Arturo Sandoval, Kien Sabe, and La Virgen de la Macarena.
The concert will close with one of this nation's most popular songs of freedom, Battle Hymn of the Republic.
please rise for the presentation of the colors and the playing of our national anthem. Please be seated. Sir, the parade is formed. Take your post, sir.
It is a privilege to welcome as our presiding official this morning, the Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Lloyd J. Austin III. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for honors to the Secretary of Defense. Please, Please be, be seated. seated. Now, now entering, entering the reviewing area is the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General David H. Berger. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for honors to General Berger. Now accompanying General Berger is the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Eric M. Smith. Please remain standing for the relinquishment of the Battle Color of the Marine Corps, which will be facilitated by the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major Troy E. Black. 
The Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps will accept the battle color from General Berger and shall perform the duties of the Commandant until a successor is appointed. Attention, Attention to orders. From President of the United States to General David H. Berger, United States Marine Corps. Subject, relinquishment of office. Effective 10 July 2023, you will stand detached from your present station and duties. At 2359 on 31 August 2023, you will be released from active duty. On 1 September 2023, you will transfer to the Marine Corps Officers Retired List. You will complete 42 years cumulative service, of which 42 years is active service. For the President, Lloyd J. Austin III, Secretary of Defense. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, a private retirement ceremony was conducted in the Marine Family Garden for General Berger, during which he received several laudatory letters from such distinguished persons as the President of the United States, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Navy, and many others. Please join us in congratulating our 38th Commandant on his most distinguished career. Ladies and gentlemen, now in the reviewing area is the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Eric M. Smith. Please rise for honors to General Smith. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of Defense and General Berger will now join General Smith in the reviewing area for pass in review.
Watch the command and review. Aye, aye, sir!
Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Lloyd J. Austin III. Well, good morning, everyone. It is indeed an honor to be here at Marine Barracks, Washington, which is the oldest active post in the United States Marine Corps. I think the performance that we saw this morning was just absolutely outstanding, and I know you would agree. Let's give them another round of applause. It's great to see Secretary Del Toro and General Milley and so many other mil military leaders and distinguished guests friends and family members. I'm delighted to be with you to celebrate the career of an outstanding Marine, our 38th Commandant of the Marine Corps, General David Berger. But he would be the first to tell you that today is a celebration of all of our outstanding Marines. For two and a half centuries, the U.S. Marines have been proudly the first to fight. They fought with valor on beaches, in cities, and in jungles. Their commitment to our democracy and to their brothers and sisters in arms is unbreakable. And their courage has long been central to America's success on the battlefield. Today we face a challenging new security landscape. But our Marines are navigating it with the same grit power, and resolve that have always set the core apart. And that's especially important in our primary theater of operations, the Indo-Pacific. You know, I was honored to visit earlier this year with some very impressive Marines in Japan and the Philippines. And I got to see firsthand how the Corps is strengthening deterrence alongside our allies. And the Corps is hard at work standing up the 12th Marine Littoral Regiment in Okinawa, which will make our joint force even more lethal. Marines are also central to our operations and deterrence in Europe. They train alongside our NATO allies on everything from cold weather operations to mountain warfare. And as Russia continues its cruel war of choice against Ukraine, our stand-in force of Marines is critical for NATO's deterrence and defense. In fact, it's hard to find a spot on the globe where Marines aren't making it safer. And when a crisis erupts, we count our, on our Marines to be ready for anything and to leap into action. Today, as we work to strengthen our military for the great competitions ahead, the Marine Corps is absolutely central. The Force Design 2030 plan outlines how the Marines will modernize the Corps to deepen America's deterrence and, if necessary, to fight and win wherever they must. And General Dave Berger, has led this historic and transformational effort. He's done so with vision and creativity and boldness. He's not just willing to embrace change, he's eager to lead change. It's often said that militaries are always preparing to fight the last war. General Berger has been driving hard to deter the next war. In his four years as Commandant, he has focused relentlessly on the future fight. He has faced hard choices, and he's faced them head on. He's encouraged creative thinking at every level of the Corps, and he has pushed our department to redefine readiness for the 21st century. Now, Despite all of his achievements, 
Dave is one of the most humble leaders in our inventory. In fact, he probably hates the fact that I'm talking about him right now. But I'm going to do it for a few more minutes, Dave, so just relax and deal with it. You know, anyone who's worked in government knows how tempting it can be to just kick the can down the road or to make do with the old ways for a little bit longer. But that's not Dave Berger. His staff says that he has never once hit the easy button. And that's been true throughout his, throughout his career. As a young officer, General Berger did it all. Reconnaissance training, jump master school, combat dive, you name it. He went on to command the 1st Marine Division in Afghanistan, the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force in Camp Pendleton, and Fleet Marine Forces Pacific, where he saw firsthand what it takes to deter aggression in the Indo-Pacific. He is a warrior scholar. He's a tremendous communicator. He's a tireless advocate for younger Marines, and he's a great listener. In fact, General Berger believes that the more senior you get, the more important it is to listen to everyone, no matter their rank or their title. Young majors on his staff recall that General Berger would ask them about their own experiences in the Corps and how things could work better. And for anyone with a good idea, he's always got an open door and an open mind. Now, if you ask General Berger how he stays grounded, his answer is simple. His family. And let me recognize General Berger's parents, J.C. and Martha, and his wife, Donna, and their four sons, Joseph, Ryan, Philip, and Jeffrey. You know, there is nothing more important to Dave than family. He loves coaching his son's sports teams, bragging on their accomplishments, and riding four-wheelers back on the farm with his grandchildren. He takes leave just to spend time with his family, and he turns his phone off so that he can be present. And Dave always make cl makes clear to the teams that he leaves, family comes first. He loves talking with his staff about what their families are up to, and he encourages them to make sure that they're spending time with their loved ones. And that really makes a difference to Marines at all levels of the Corps. So I want to thank Dave for his focus on family, and I want to thank this outstanding military family for serving right alongside General Berger. Donna, thanks for all that you've done for our country and the United States Marine Corps, and for your tireless work on behalf of our families. You know, this year marks 42 years since Dave became a Marine, and 42 years of marriage for Dave and Donna. So let's give it up for the both of them. <laughs> and to General Berger's children and your families, thanks for your love and support and for what you're doing to serve our country as well. You know, years ago, Dave and Donna had a conversation about whether he should stay in the Marines. And they decided that if he ever had three bad days in a row, he'd get out of the military. And General Berger says that he's never had those three bad days in a row. 
So Dave, I want to thank you for everything that you have done to strengthen the Marine Corps and to defend the United States. Now I know that everyone here is looking forward to the rapid confirmation of a distinguished successor to General Berger. You know, it's been more than a century since the U.S. Marine Corps has operated without a Senate-confirmed commandant. And smooth and timely transitions of confirmed leadership are central to the defense of the United States and to the full strength of the most powerful fighting force in history. And stable and orderly leadership transitions are also vital to maintaining our unmatched network of allies and partners and they're crucial for our military readiness. And of course, our military families give up so much to support those who, they, who serve. So they shouldn't be weighed down with any extra uncertainty. We have a sacred duty to do right by those who volunteer to wear the cloth of our nation. And I remain confident that all Americans can come together to agree on that basic obligation to those who keep us safe. I am also confident that the United States Senate will meet its responsibilities. And I look forward to welcoming an outstanding new commandant for our Marine Corps and to adding many other distinguished senior leaders across the Joint Force. You know, there's a saying in the Marines, we don't accept applications, only commitments. And every day, Marines bring their trademark commitment, quiet but fierce. They bring that commitment to their teammates, to their commanders, and to their country. That commitment has allowed America to fight and win countless battles across centuries. That commitment is what lets America race to the aid of those in need anywhere on the planet. And that commitment is why I am confident that our military is ready to deter aggression whenever, wherever we can and to fight and win wherever we must, today, tomorrow, and for decades to come. And I am confident that we will rise to the challenge of making our country stronger and making our world safer. To our United States Marine Corps, Thank you for your unfailing commitment to our country. And to General Berger, thank you for your unfailing commitment to our United States Marine Corps. May God bless you and your family. May God bless the United States Marine Corps. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the 38th Commandant of the Marine Corps, General David H. Berger. As the secretary pointed out, the band sounded phenomenal this morning. But of course, a ceremony like this takes a lot of pieces and parts to organize it, to schedule it. So if from the barracks here in security and protocol, the marching unit behind us, all the protocol team at headquarters, Marine Corps, NCIS for security, all of the people that had a hand in the ceremony, can you please join me in thanking them?
I am very grateful, Donna and I, and the Smiths, for folks who traveled here distances to get here. As you pointed out earlier, some folks called this morning because of canceled flights. For those who made it here, thank you. I begin quickly with my parents. This is where, for me, what the Marine Corps talks about in terms of values of honor, courage, and commitment, I got them before I came in the Marine Corps. I got them from my parents. They taught me about honor. They taught me about keeping my word. They taught all four of us about responsibility and about protecting the family. More than that, perhaps they didn't just teach us, even sitting here in the front row today, they are our personal example. This is what right looks like. They have been married 67 years and they continue to be my role model. All of us serving in the military have friends from around the world. I won't go through all of them today. But I am very grateful for 42 years of friendships that I think we will carry on long, long beyond this. Some of them here, like the Bennetts and the Bowies, and some of them who called us yesterday and the day before, like Jim and Carla Hogan from the West Coast, and so many other families this is what makes the Marine Corps so special. I would also like to acknowledge the families like the Hogan's who are Gold Star families, who we have come to know, especially over the last four or five years, much deeper. It is tough in combat to send Marines home back to their families, and when you get back on this end and you see the strength of their families, the Gold Star families, it's simply amazing. I am grateful to Secretary Spencer, Richard Spencer. He took a chance on me four years ago, probably more than a chance, probably more like a gamble, but it, I am very grateful for you giving me the opportunity. I'm grateful for Secretary Del Toro, who gave me the confidence to keep going and back me every step of the way for the past two years since he came in. Sir, I'm grateful for you being here, and I'm grateful for your steady support, and I'm grateful for your mentorship. The Joint Chiefs. I did not understand the role of a service chief until probably Joe Dunford explained it to me as pretty simple, that you will have two roles, one running the service, and the other being a Joint Chief. And I asked him, how did he spend his time between those two roles? Very easy for him to respond. He said, you can make a mistake as a commandant. The Marine Corps will cover for you. But when it comes to giving advice, giving recommendations to the Secretary of Defense, to the President, you cannot get that wrong. And I took that to heart. I am very grateful for my fellow Joint Chiefs that are here. We talked about what was important for our service, but in the end, in the end, we met with the chairman and told him what's best for the whole force. And chairman, I'm grateful for your leadership, and I'm grateful for your friendship, and I'm grateful for what you did from Iraq to Afghanistan to all the Friday sessions in the tank where you put the nation and the servicemen and women and their families first. And you and Polly, two months from now, will be there cheering from the bleachers. Sergeant Major Black and Stacy. We grew up in the Marine Corps serving alongside a senior enlisted leader. We're so blessed to have a sergeant major from the time you're a lieutenant colonel on. Had no idea that becoming commandant it would take it to another level. We traveled with the blacks everywhere. I made no decisions, none, without long one-on-one -on -one discussions with Sergeant Major Troy Black. I have been so blessed, Don and I have been so blessed to know the two of them, to become lifelong friends with them. The Marine Corps is in great hands, in the Smith's hands, and the, and the whole joint force is in great hands with the senior enlisted senses and common sense of Sergeant Major Troy Black and his wife, Stacy. Every commander has a phenomenal staff. I was blessed to have that and commanders around the world. 
You don't need to micromanage when you have leaders like that. In fact, the hardest thing to do is try to keep up, which I probably was not very successful at. I'm thankful to everyone at Headquarters Marine Corps, all the deputy commandants, all the commanders around the world. I'm grateful for all the Marines I got to serve alongside. This is a privilege. All of us who are generals, admirals, know that we could have been sent home a long time ago and been really happy, really fulfilled. We live on borrowed time, and we feel like it. So I'm grateful for every single Marine I served alongside. All the former commandants told me about the fire trucks two blocks up, I had no idea. You're getting a small taste of it. When you're the commandant, when you're a general officer, you have sometimes both aides and enlisted aides. We have been blessed to have both. I won't call them out by name. We cannot function without them. And they make us and the Marine Corps and all of our services look 100% sharp every day. Donna, this is my soulmate. We have been married 42 years. She could certainly trade up. I don't have that option. We met in sixth grade, and uh, for me, probably the best reflection of uh, your, finding your soulmate and knowing it's the right one, we talked about this earlier today, is when you see your kids raise their kids, then you know you did it right because you just sit back, smile, and know that all those values that came from my parents went down two levels down, and it's really fun to watch. I love you, babe. To the Smiths, everybody says that at, at a change of command, I'm really happy to turn it over to my friend. I think every single ceremony we've ever been to, I'm really happy to turn it over to my friend. We've gotten to know the Smiths really well in the last six, seven years. We knew them before by reputation. The Marine Corps is in fantastic hands, and I'm with you, Mr. Secretary. We need the Senate to do their job so that we can have a sitting commandant that's appointed and confirmed. And we need that house to be occupied. We ask the Senate to do that. I have tried to be the servant leader that my mentors coached me to do. That was my goal. Every Marine is a rifleman. We believe that in the Marine Corps. And I tried my best to put the rifleman in the center, an 0311 infantry squad leader in the center every time. We all work for them. We know as Marines who we are. Tried my best to make sure that the Marine Corps is ready today and also ready five, 10 years from now. And where we have succeeded, all the credit goes to all of the Marines around the world who are trying things, experimenting. They're pushing us into the future. And where we have come up short, that's on mine. That's on me. They get the credit, as it should be, always. This has been the honor of my life, the privilege of my life, for me and Donna to serve all Marines, all families, all sailors everywhere. Semper Fidelis, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Eric M. Smith. Good morning to everyone and thanks for being here. Mr. Secretary, Mr. Secretary, and for all of the distinguished visitors, too many to name. Thank you for taking the time to honor your Marines and to honor our 38th Commandant. 
Dave, I can say that now. Uh, and I can also say, as the individual performing the duties of the Commandant, on behalf of all Marines, we thank you and Donna for your 42 years of dedicated, selfless, and courageous service for those who have taken the time to look at uh, General Berger's medals. Courage is shown across those medals, and we should take the time to once again acknowledge the Burgers, their entire family, and it's a big family because when you have the Secretary of the Navy sitting in one row over because the Burgers are filling up the entire one north, that's, that's a good day. That's a good day. So, uh, so Dave and Donna, on behalf of all of us, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll get the one thing out very quickly. Uh, if you're saying, what, what am I supposed to call you? Uh, ACMAC. That, that is my title and one that I'm proud of. We've got the ACMAC squad sitting over here. So you can also say Devil Dog, Leatherneck, Marine, or Trisha's husband. I respond to all probably most proud of the last. There are a tremendous number of supporters of your Marine Corps here today, and all of us appreciate the support because what you saw today was an embodiment, a representation of the more than 200,000 active and reserve Marines who are out there ready, willing, able, and eager, eager to defend the Constitution. So those young Marines that you saw today, they're 18, 19, and they are willing to do anything, everything on your behalf, and they are owed our eternal gratitude. I will simply say that in the audience today, without going through everyone, there are examples of our friends, our partners, our allies, and we have lots of them. I'm looking at them all right now. We have lots. There are also personal examples of courage, some from our allies and partners, like Colonel Taguchi, who's over here, who committed as a battalion commander from the Georgian Infantry to serve alongside us in Afghanistan, lost both legs, and he's here. Alexei, it's good to, to have you here because you, you are an embodiment of, of everyone and everything that we hold dear. We have people like uh, Major Dave Borden, who's a retired Marine Major, who after losing his right leg at the hip and a good chunk of his left arm in Iraq, two years in the hospital, and then he deployed to Afghanistan for a year, twice, as an amputee, as an infantry officer. So we are surrounded by individuals like that, and we are so grateful for it. My own family, uh, my wife Trish today representing the family, um, she is the, the better half, the, uh, the, the stable rock upon which we build the foundation. Our children cannot be here. Elise and her husband Matt are down in Houston working, uh, hopefully paying for my retirement boat. That's the, that's the plan. And our son Travis and his wife Hadley are in Texas burying her father. Uh, he is uh, an American hero, a firefighter, who is, uh, is currently donating his organs, so they have to be there for that. But that's, uh, that's another example of what real courage looks like to make sure that there is no confusion. All orders, directives, and guidance, which were in effect this morning, remain in effect unless I direct otherwise. Further guidance to the force will follow. But for the Marines, what I can tell you is this. Two simultaneous missions right now. Continue to accelerate modernization in preparation for a peer fight, state-on-state -state conflict that we have not seen in our lifetime, while simultaneously maintaining and continuing to improve the readiness of our combined arms, global, naval crisis response force. The 26th Expeditionary Unit will head out the door as a mu SOC, Special Operations Cape. We haven't done that in 10 years. That's on your leadership, General Berger. Those are the two missions, and we do those two missions by ironclad discipline, by strict, almost ruthless adherence to our standards. That is what is expected of all of us. For the officers sitting here, this is the time when we earn ductus exemplo. It's what, uh, what is expected of all of us who are forced to wear black trousers, and if you don't understand that, I'll do two seconds and explain it. We don't get to wear black trousers. If you notice the generals 
have black trousers, not blue trousers like the young enlisted Marines, as if it's a, a status symbol. It is not. They are required to wear those trousers because if you look at the old photos from the 1800s, at the end of a long campaign, especially out west, everyone started with dark blue trousers, almost black trousers. By the end of the campaign, when they took their photo, those who had survived the campaign, they would have the general sitting in the front with their riding boots, and uh, their trousers were still very dark, black. But the troopers who had been out doing the fighting and the dying, their trousers had been sunwashed, bleached, and faded into a light blue. So every day that we pull on our black trousers as general officers, it's a reminder to be mindful of the orders that we issue because an 18-year-old is going to have to execute them. So to the general officers here today, I'll expect, and I know I can count on you leading the way via ductus exemplo. Mr. Secretary, distinguished guests, and to the burgers, Dave and Donna, thank you very much for all the Marines out there. Continue to march, pick up the pace. I'll be with you every step of the way. Semper Fidelis. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. At this time, we ask that you please remain in your seats for the departure of the official party, after which a receiving line will open for General Berger and the reception will commence in the Marine Family Garden for General Smith. On behalf of Marine Barracks, Washington, D.C., thank you for your attendance and Semper Fidelis.